Realm presents The Shadow Files of Morgan Knox. Episode 6 The city around Knox dies and rots. The wall behind her is roughening, twisting, and warping into jagged corners, sharp edges, giving under her weight. She stumbles, inhales shakily. The air stings, burns into her sinuses. She gropes for a mask at her chest. Rubber and metal under her fingers. Or is there? Is that bone? Bones. Her clavicles, her sternum, jammed against her skin, trying to break through and escape. She looks wildly around, breath coming hard. Bones are cracking the grimy pavement and thrusting through. The air is wailing sirens, every particle an exploding shell, and it won't stop. She remembers it, the barrage that went on and on and on, beat into your skull until eventually you stopped hearing it at all. That wailing. She pushes away from the wall of the trench. This is no time to lose her grip, and in fact, a grip is precisely what she needs to get. Force her way through the burgeoning fear, the way she has so many times. The way it's become so awfully easy to, and do her work. Do what she came to do. Save people. What she's smelling isn't gas. She's sure of that. But it's smoke, and it burns, and that's familiar enough, too. The men she's trying to reach won't be foaming at the mouth and fighting hopelessly to breathe through their melting lungs. But the shelling has reached them, and they need her. They need her. She's here because they need her. She goes out because they need her. Morgan Knox is not a damn fool, whatever they say. But the men lie screaming, sobbing, dying, stuck in the mud and strung on the wire. They lie curled into the meager protection of the deeper shell holes, clinging to the scattered pieces of their friends. No one will come for them if she doesn't. No one will hold them. No one will drag them back. The wailing and rushing feet, shadows and shouts through the street, the trench. Knox clutches at the bag of medical supplies at her hip and starts to move. It's as bad as she feared. The casualties and survivors packed into a wider section of trench, some standing and some lying, some crumpled against the walls. Mud, blood, impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins, and wide, pale eyes unnaturally bright in their filthy faces catching and fiercely holding light that shouldn't be there to catch. She can't tell, just now, if it's day or night. The clouds and the smoke are far too thick, and the pulsing light of artillery fire glares through both and makes them a sickly yellow-green-brown haze. The color of gangrene. She reaches them and snatches up her bag, drops into a crouch by the nearest one. Looks him over. He stares up at her, hazy, and shuddering with agony and terror. He's gripping his shoulder, and blood, like black oil, is flowing between his fingers. He can't be older than 17. He has a mother. That's what she always thinks. He has a mother. They all have mothers, fathers, siblings, girls and boys, someone who loves them, someone they won't be going home to. His lips move. He might be calling to her, his mother, so often they want their mothers. Mama, Mama, might be seeing her in Knox's face. She hopes so. Gently, she tugs his hand aside. There's no arm there. There's nothing but shredded cloth and strips of flesh, splintered gray bone. Blood pumps sluggishly into a pool at the bottom of the trench beneath him. If she was closer to the field hospital, she might be able to save him. But she's seen more than enough to know when something is impossible. She's seen more than enough to know, with a horribly flat calculus, when something is a waste of time and effort that she might spend on someone who truly can be saved. Still, she briefly considers a tourniquet. Maybe, maybe she can get someone to help carry him back. Back to where? You can't go back. Everything is on fire. She lays a hand on his hitching chest and bends close, pushes off his helmet and strokes a hand across his sweaty brow. She feels her lips move, but can't hear her own voice over the persistent wail. 
Dios mío, que me oiga. A plea to a god she's rapidly losing the last of her faith in. Sleep, sweetheart. It's going to be fine. Just rest now. The boy shudders and dies. Knox doesn't cry for him. If she cried for them, she'd die herself, dried up and wrinkled like a mummy from shedding all those tears. She used to. It feels like a long time ago. The flash boom of shellfire. It gleams off the boy's open eyes. The pavement, a puddle near a bunch of trash bins. And she closes them with steady fingertips. His skin is already cold. She feels at his throat, his chest, finds the chain, rubs her thumb over the tiny raised letters on the identification tags. She won't read them. For reasons she couldn't begin to explain, she believes his name is not for her to know. The wailing continues, a harsh warble that cuts through the guns. She has to get up. She has to go. She has to help them, the living ones and the ones who won't live. They need her. She used to make friends. She still tries. Once, on the island, the green and sun-soaked jewel that is Puerto Rico, she had plenty of friends. Songs, dances, good company, lots of smiles. The admiring attention of handsome boys on warm summer nights. Then, she left for the war. The war is cold. There is no dancing. And she tries to make friends, but it's getting so hard. But there are still songs. She sits, exhausted on her cot in the field hospital, her head in her hands, and her eyes squeezed shut. She knows she's breathing in the stink of blood and sickness and infection, the sharp tang of antiseptic. But it's yet another thing she no longer notices much. Around the stained privacy curtain and in the sanctuary, amid the debris they never quite managed to clear and the rows of beds, there's the sound of moans, cries of pain. That wail, more distant now. Where is it coming from? But mingling with them, outside the half-ruined church they've commandeered, a small chorus of voices, slightly wobbly with drink, although she can't hear a melody. It's as if there's no melody at all, as if it's been blasted away like leaves skinned off the trees and only the words remain. I've seen some beautiful flowers grow in life's garden fair. I've spent some wonderful hours lost in their fragrance rare. But I have found another, wondrous beyond compare. There's a rose that grows in no man's land, and it's wonderful to see. Though it's sprayed with tears, it will live for years in my garden of memory. Knox drops her hands and lifts her head. She almost smiles. She can't decide when she hears the men, the boys, sing this song, whether or not it's some kind of joke. Because they try, her and the others, they really do. But it seems to her that they lose more than they save. It's never been this bad. It was horrible before the Marne, but this is something new. Is a hospital a good place? Or is it simply a place where it takes longer to die? They need her, and she's so afraid that she's failing them. It's the one red rose the soldier knows. It's the work of the master's hand. Neath the war's great curse stands a Red Cross nurse. She's the rose of no man's land. Morgan Knox, who is no rose of any land as far as she's concerned, curls up on her bunk and falls into something which, while it can't properly be called sleep, is at least mercifully not consciousness. But they're chanting. In her dreams they're chanting, the work of the master's hand and a curse. Tears, salt on her lips. A dappled gray horse fleeing a burning barn with its mane in flames, screaming as its hide blackens and cracks wet pink. The wailing barrage shatters the world, and the chant calls something awful through the shards. This is not a song. 
These are not soldiers singing. Knox gasps and chokes on the smoke, fumbles for a gas mask that isn't there, and her own footfalls on the pavement thud in her head like exploding shells. The sound of engines snarling, the deep rumble of the tanks crushing trees and men. Flying ash is flying bodies, shredded, bleeding pieces of what used to be whole. She tears into the night. For a few days, as the battle is beginning, she does have one person she would call a friend. Nancy, from South Carolina. Nancy keeps her hair pulled back in a bun that never holds. She always ends up with kinky strands of it clouded around her face. She's young, barely into her 30s, but there are already streaks of gray cutting through the black. Her features were full and rounded when Knox first met her at Bellow Wood. But in the weeks since then, they've become pinched and thin, as if she's being slowly hollowed out from the inside. Knox thought she was beautiful when they met. She still does. Nancy is her friend. Not because Knox thinks Nancy is beautiful, but because Nancy is willing to talk about home without being maudlin or overwhelming. Nancy gives her just enough to paint a picture of something worth escaping into and something worth going back for. She lived mostly in the countryside, and she talks about cascading ridges of blue mountains, arched paths made by moss-covered oaks. She talks about long green summers and walks in the woods. She loves birds and describes their calls so vividly that Knox can almost hear them. Sometimes Knox falls asleep, not to the distant rattle of gunfire, but to the clear tear, 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 of a warbler in the trees. Nancy doesn't talk much about her family. Knox doesn't press. When someone is your friend, you don't demand more from them than they seem inclined to give. Years later, she'll still feel that way. She'll feel that way more than ever. But after they reach the Marne, Nancy no longer talks about the mountains or the birds. She doesn't talk much at all. She watches the waves of men, boys, brought in on stretchers, and she holds them down and sops up the blood, plucks maggots out of wounds, folds guts back behind slashed abdominal muscles, carries away severed limbs to be burned. She does her work, saves the ones she can, eases pain wherever possible. She does talk to the soldiers more than she speaks to Knox, low, soft words that Knox can never quite make out. There's a period when Knox is actually and stupidly jealous, feeling like she's losing something, and then she pushes that feeling away. There's no sense in feeling jealous of that. There's no room for it. You have to guard the space for your feelings. Keep your fingers in the dikes, or the war will sweep in and flood it all away. But a week into the battle, Nancy breaks. Who can say why people break? Who knows what finally lands a blow on a widening crack? hard enough and direct enough to bust it wide open. She lost someone. That's all Knox knows. Lost another one, perhaps no different than all the others. And all at once, Nancy is crushed against her, shaking, pressing in so close that Knox thinks Nancy might want to cut through her skin and spread her ribcage and burrow inside. This place is making us into human shell holes. The dead collect inside us. She holds on to Nancy, moves her hands slowly over her back. Nancy raises her head and stares at Knox with her wide, dark eyes, her pinched face, her brown skin that seems to be draining into a deep gray. The kiss is messy and rough, and it doesn't last very long. Knox groans into it and feels something electric shoot like a bullet from the top of her spine to between her thighs, cans her hips forward, but Nancy pulls her lower body away, and then pulls everything away, ducks her head, and hurries out of the nook in the vestry that they've tucked themselves into. Knox watches her go, numb, except for a cold sense of embarrassed annoyance. These kinds of things happen in war. She's caught glimpses of it here and there with some of the men. But she was still a fool to think it might happen here. She doesn't even fully understand what it is. The next day, Nancy is gone. Invalided out, she hears. 
Battle fatigue. It's not generally supposed to happen to the nurses, given that they don't fight. But it does. Knox wants desperately to believe that the moment of frantic connection didn't happen merely because Nancy was breaking. But she can't get the thought out of her mind. After that, she stops making friends. She goes over the top. She goes over the top again and again. It starts as a moment of desperate recklessness. She lifts her head over a parapet, and through the smoke she sees men hanging on the wire, crawling toward her, crying out. How is she supposed to wait for them to reach her? How is she supposed to wait for someone else to break away from the fighting and carry them? The men are here to fight, not care for the wounded. Why is she here? if all she does is hide in a trench and wait to triage what's left when the shooting stops. She scrambles over the top and rushes across the pitted ground, head low, dodging blindly. By the time the gray sky fades into black, she's retrieved seven men, got them out of no man's land practically on her back. They managed to save all but one. That's a good day. She thought that moment of madness could be the end of it. It's not. Again and again she goes over, and increasingly, she doesn't just bring them back to the trench and treat them there. She braves the bullets and the shells to do what she can where they're lying, buy them a better chance by the time she does manage to get them back. She loses so many, but she does save more of them that way. It's worth it. Her own fear is like sleet pelting her mind, but she can push it aside because they need her. In the field hospital, in the trenches, they mutter that she's crazy. She's not the only one who ventures into no man's land, not by any means, but she's the one who virtually can't be kept out of it. It's battle fatigue, shell shock, but not the kind that sends people to hospitals behind the lines and even home. Men get like this sometimes, take wild risks, and seem to lose all care for their own lives. Those men are often removed from service, but no one knows what to do when it appears in a woman. So they let her go. And otherwise, they mostly leave her alone. Rushed in. She rushes in, that's what she does. She rushed in among the robes and the masks and it all went to hell. She regards this fact with no particular surprise. Then there was him. He was clinging to the raggedy edge with the gas filling his lungs. And she helped him because he needed her. She covers her ears at the shriek of the dying horses the wail of the sirens. The sky is on fire, and every window of every building is a gaping wound, dripping infection. Spindly things like twisted man-spiders crawl on all fours in waves toward her, their heads bloody bandages and pus. It all happened before. It never stopped. Except, wait, was it just her? Or was someone else there? Did someone else come over the top this time and drag her out of no man's land? She's almost certain. She sees that face. In fractured snatches and glimpses, she sees it. In the ruins, she sees it. The world broke open and she saw it. Blood on her hands and she saw it. She saw him through the smoke and the smash of bodies and the war. Ruined face and one blue eye. He was there. And then he was here, both places together, wasn't he? It was a lie. She can't save anyone. In the hospital, circled around the fire with their cloaks and masks and black eyes, that's what the men are chanting. I've seen some withered flowers grow in life's, life's garden, garden dead. I've spent some ghastly hours. Lost, lost in my, in my ruined, ruined head. head. But, but I, I have found another, another that, that fills my heart with dread. There's, dread. There's a rose that grows, that grows in no man's, man's land, and is hideous, hideous to see. see. It, it lives stained, stained with blood, in a, in a trench, trench of, mud, of mud, and in, in my, my tomb, tomb of, of memory. memory. She's in no man's land when she hears it. She's been out here so long, she's lost track of the hours. She has no idea what time it was when she went over the top. But night is falling, the air simultaneously darkening and brightening with the glow of fire and explosions. 
At night, the shadows get weird and the landscape is unreliable. She's more likely to trip, fall, turn an ankle, get snagged on wire, run up against a bayonet. Even night will usually chase mad Morgan Knox back into the trench and eventually to the hospital to tend to the ones already there. But she's been out so long and she's traveled out so far. It's difficult to be certain where the core of the fighting is. She scans around and perceives that the rushing figures of the men have thinned out and the thunder of the guns is more remote. Or she's remote, circling to the outskirts. Bodies lie strewn all around her, broken and torn. It's been a while since she came upon one still alive. She has to find her way back. She's struggling to regain her orientation, searching the thick air for any indication of the direction of the sinking sun. When she hears it and freezes, her head cocked like a bird's. At first, she thinks it's a voice, but it isn't, it can't be. If it is, it's like no voice she's ever heard, even distorted by the battlefield. Might be a cry, might be a scream, except a human voice contains one tone, and this seems to have several, layered one on top of the other, high and deep. A chorus? No. These tones are floating through the air in absolute sync, and they are all the same, emanating from the same source. She's certain of it, although she couldn't say why. Not a voice at all. No pause for breath. It goes on and on. A horn? Some kind of siren? Like the ones blaring around her now. The people who got to the scene of the crime far too late, just like they always do. Don't, part of her whispers. Don't go to it. Stay away. It's nothing good, nothing good at all. But it's a thing to follow, so she does. And it takes her right back into the center of the storm. When she was a child, she lived through a hurricane. She lived through plenty in her time before she left, but this one was especially bad. It swept in from an Atlantic ocean, gone a terrible slate gray, and raged across the island tearing roofs off buildings, ripping up flamboyant trees, and scattering their red blossoms like showers of brilliant blood. The worst of it came at night, and little Morgan Knox sheltered in her boarded-up house and listened to the trembling voices praying in the dark, broken only by the shivering light of a lantern. For protection, for salvation, for their souls. Knox found it difficult to believe that even God could defend them from so much fury. And then, after a few hours, she realized that a hurricane was in and of itself the work of God, since all the world was God's work. And therefore, it was God himself who was menacing them with his howling wind. What did they do? Was it just them? Had the entire island offended him somehow? Was this another flood? Only no one had been warned to build an ark? The faith that surrounded her was strong, but that night was the first time her own faith weakened. It wasn't the last. She's listened to the men singing songs about the battlefield and about home, so much weary yearning in their voices. But she's also heard some of them singing hymns, here in a place many of those same men have sincerely referred to as hell. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Knox hasn't said a single prayer since she crossed the Atlantic. She isn't praying now as the battle hurricane rises around her. Bullets whizzing and cracking through the air over her head. She's gritting her teeth as she pushes through the smoky darkness, lit in strobe by the guns. A night attack. Sometimes it's planned and sometimes it just happens that way. Shapes are rushing and stumbling around her. She sees more than one of them fall. Almost stops to see if there's anything she can do. But as much as she's always been compelled to do that, 
And as much as that voice in the back of her mind is urging her to stay away from the strange, unearthly sound, something inexplicably stronger is drawing her onward, toward it, toward where she thinks it must be. The running shapes are faceless. They might already be ghosts. If no man's land is hell, it makes sense to her now that people might be condemned to it. Like on the island back home. Did they offend God somehow? Did they do something to deserve this? Did she? She's not praying. Even if she was so inclined, she's too busy trying to keep her feet, trying to keep moving. The sound hasn't died away and hasn't been subsumed under the cacophony. If anything, it's rising in volume. And it's not only coming to her through the air. It's coming from inside her own head. It dizzies her. Something is wrong, she thinks. Everything is wrong here. This entire world has gone horribly wrong. But even in the midst of that all-encompassing wrongness, this is worse. Something, somewhere, is breaking. And it's drawing her in, calling to something in her. Later, she'll think about God again, and about that night back home, as the hurricane battered her house all those years ago. And she'll think about what the existence of God implies, that another power is out there, out there. And the priest warned, always trying to slither like a nest of snakes into every human heart. She grips the strap of her supply bag as if it can stabilize her and plods forward. Once again, the soldiers are thinning out, or they seem to be. And whether the noise of the guns is genuinely farther away, or that other terrible sound is drowning it out, the guns are quieter. But that sound, which dies when the structure looms out of the dark. She stops, staring up at it as if she can't quite make sense of what it is. It seems to be changing shape and size as she watches, lit up a sickly yellow-green and thrown back into shadow second by second. But that in and of itself isn't so unusual. Finding a building still standing in no man's land isn't so unusual. Yet she's always a little surprised when it happens to her, because a human structure is so incongruous. It doesn't fit. It feels like a mistake that the destruction hasn't totally claimed it. But there's something different about this one. From what she can see, while it hasn't been totally claimed, it's been hit. The first story is largely intact, but the upper floor is half blown away, roof fallen in, and stone walls crumbled the frame of two visible windows jutting up like crooked teeth. It's not that it looks different, not from the outside. Knox moves toward the doorless doorway, like a woman in a dream. She's still a few yards away when she sees the patrol. Her throat snaps shut on her breath, and before she has time to make a conscious choice, she's lunging to the left and ducking behind the remains of a farm cart the muddy ground soft under her knees. She lowers her head, peeks through the splintered wheels. Hello there, Jerry, she thinks with a wry prickle. The light is unsteady, but she knows them at a glimpse. One of them, passing, and another one coming toward him. She takes in the heavy gate, the instantly identifiable rounded helmets, the rifles in their hands, and dully gleaming bayonets. She listens hard, hears a mutter of German when they reach each other. But there's something else about them. She's only a few feet away. She leans forward slightly to see them better. It's their helmets, she decides. It's subtle. It might be only her imagination, but she'd swear they're wearing them wrong. Pulled down low. Too low. She can't see their eyes. It's bothering her that she can't. It's bothering her very much. She hasn't given any thought to what she'll do once she's gotten to this point. She barely thought on her way here. But now thinking seems indicated. Stay where she is and keep watching? Get away once they've moved on and there's a decent chance? Look for a way to get past them? Into the house? Why in the hell would she want to do that? Then something, fate, God, random stupid chance, gives her a reason.
There are different ways of saving people. She knows this. All around her, the storm of noise and smoke and flashing lights continues without any regard for her, and she exists inside it, feels her own fear like a body carried on her back. You always lose something when you save people. Time, energy, blood, everything. You give something up. It's a trade. This chaos of sirens and voices and strobing lights is a hurricane, a barrage. She has no shelter from it. There's no boarded up house and no shell hole to crawl into. But no one even knows she's here, in the middle of a no man's land of concrete and brick and steel, bones and gangrenous flesh. She's breathed a lung full of poison. She gave up the only thing that might have served as an antidote. It's too late. Her throat and chest are bubbling with the gas. She's melting from the inside out. All around her seethe vaguely human shapes who must own the voices she hears. They're closing in on her, and a quavering part of her wants to reach for them and implore them to help her. Please, help her. Why can't they help her? Pack, seizing her by the arms as she starts to pitch over, yanking her upright and shaking her his face snapping so sharp and so clear. Although she can see the skull, dead and dry, and grinning just beneath the surface of his skin, and the even thinner surface of time, that face close to hers, and his eyes burning wild and worried, and still slightly unfocused in their sockets, and his voice joined to the sirens which howl with the fire, shouting her name, shouting for her to, Snap out of it, Knox. It's over. We're all right. Get yourself together. Half sounding like he's shouting at himself. And he can't help her. Abe, there right in front of her as she lurches free of Pack and stumbles around. Such a familiar expression of dismay and anger twisting his features that she aches for him. Him reaching for her, too, and holding her in place. In this time which is no better in its way than the war. Cursing her for not letting him in on this. Snarling that... Of course, when something goes up in flames in this fucking city, you're in the middle of it. And she recognizes his anger as a thing forged from the fear he hates. And she aches again. Because he wants to help so badly, and he can't help her. None of them can help her. Where she is, sliding helplessly through a spiraling span of time, no one can reach her. No one can save her. She pulls away and hugs herself, and is unable to walk straight. A withered rose. You give something up when you save someone. When there's no one to save you, when you have to save yourself, there's nothing left to trade. Another two Germans haul the soldier out of the shadows. Knox's breath freezes all over again. At first, she's terribly certain that he's dead. He looks like so many corpses she's seen. His head is lolling as he's dragged across the yard toward the house, his muscles limp as far as she can see. But as he passes close to her, she hears him groan and croak something, and he struggles for a brief moment to lift his head before the strength bleeds out of him. And he is bleeding, his left temple and cheek painted with it, and nasty patches of blood on his upper arm that she takes for bayonet wounds. No way to say whether his injuries, the ones she can see, and possibly others she can't, are lethal. But no way to say that they aren't. The four Germans exchange a few clipped words. The two patrolling guards nod and turn on their heels, start their circuit of the house in the other direction. The two carrying the soldier continue their passage to the house and through the doorway into the dark beyond. Knox hesitates, only for a few seconds. Then she ducks out into the shadows and follows. From the outside, the house had appeared abandoned. All ruined houses appear abandoned, but it's immediately obvious to her that this one isn't. It's not sounds of occupancy that tip her off. Although as she edges cautiously into the small front hall, she does begin to hear those. It's more the quality of the initial silence. Stillness, with a background of muffled gunfire. Some silences are empty. Some aren't. This is not empty. Of course, someone is here. She saw two Germans and an American soldier enter. But this feels like more. She scans around. 
The floor is dusted with gray plaster from the cracked ceiling, and the walls are run through with cracks as well. A doorway to her right, another to her left, a third straight ahead. It should be dark in here, but it's not, and the light has no single source that she can identify. It's almost like the air of the battlefield, so much smoke and dust that the light is scattered and comes from everywhere. But this air isn't dusty. Yet when she inhales, she smells something new. Something bad. There's no other word for it, nothing to pick apart. It's simply and flatly bad. It's when she makes a right and enters what used to be a large parlor that the other sound begins. Years later, she'll hear it again, although the memory of it will take some time to return to her. Now, it instantly rocks her back, dizzies her, whispers everywhere, whispers coming through the floor and the ceiling and the walls, the peeling floral wallpaper and the fallen shelves, shattered crockery, splintered chairs, whispers, harsh and malevolent, and the image comes to her of tiny holes in the walls, hundreds of mouths with fluttering lips and chattering teeth. She lifts her hands to her ears and whirls, ice flooding into her veins. It's no good. She can't block it out. Run. Run now. In the distance, the soldier lets out a pained shout. Knox forces her way through the dizziness and the gathering nausea toward the doorway across the room. This was the kitchen. Compared to the parlor, it's small. A cast iron stove and a couple of cabinets remain. And the rest is a smashed mess, the windows blown out. The sound of fighting is louder here, but she hears an agonized grunt, peers around the corner of the doorway. One of the Germans is nowhere in sight, but the other is standing over the sprawled soldier, his rifle in his hands, and the bayonet aimed down at the helpless man on the floor. Small, chicken scratch, painted black marks that almost make sense to her surround them both. The man is trying to turn onto his side, groping for a sidearm that isn't there. She sees his wide eyes, like so many others before him, catching and holding that dreamy light, as if they cling to the light even as the light leaves. There's fear in his eyes. There's also fiery defiance. Fahrt zur Hölle, the German says and grins. It seems to go on and on, that grin, until it looks as if it might split his head clean in half. Schweine. The bayonet flashes as the German jerks it back and up. The man on the floor finally turns to face it, braces himself, and the fear vanishes from his eyes. Knox doesn't realize the chunk of stone is in her hand until she brings it down on the back of the German's head. It impacts with a dull, almost comical clang against his helmet. He doesn't fall, nor does he drop his rifle, but he staggers and turns to look at her, blinking, and clearly bewildered. The blow knocked his helmet back, and she sees his eyes. This is something else she'll encounter again, and something else she won't recall at the time. His eyes are completely and utterly black. Was zum Teufel? He breathes, and Knox slams the stone into his face. This time, the rifle falls. Then, so does he. She might have left it at that. He's down, only twitching weakly, as blood streams over his face from a broken nose and a split forehead. Or she might have snatched up the rifle and finished him with a bullet, the bayonet if she wanted to keep it quiet. But the priest warned them all that the devil was always with them, always trying to slither inside them. And the devil is the hurricane, and the hurricane is raging outside, hailing bullets and shells and blowing gas. The devil is the hurricane is the war, is inside her. The whispers in her head, something cracking open, and something else beginning to push its awful way through. She drops to her knees and raises the stone high and brings it down again. Again, the wet crunching thud like a tank crushing a body. She feels warm droplets flecking her cheeks and throat. She tastes copper on her lips. The German isn't moving. She always tried to save people. 
The stone tumbles out of her hand, and she stares at the pinkish pulpy mess she's made of the German's head. All she hears is her own ragged gasping. And more. Not whispers. She raises her head, and for the first time she sees what's in front of her. One side of the kitchen opens onto the back of the house. At the other, standing opposite her, is a wide-set doorway. And through it, a fire seems to be burning. Not in a fireplace, not in a stove. It's in the open. And she glimpses the flames through a wall of shifting bodies. People, half shuffling and half dancing. None of them appears to have noticed her. The soldier is pushing himself up, reaching for her. She should go to him, get him up, get him out of here. And she will in a moment, but for now, she's lifting herself clumsily to her feet and stepping toward the doorway and whatever is happening in the next room. It's not a room, or it was, and it was a very large one, but that was before the house got hit by the storm of the war. And now it's a great central space open to the sky. Knox stands in the doorway and gazes at the scene. Not more German soldiers, but people in flowing robes and strange masks, with distorted, inhuman features, turning in a slow circle, twisting their bodies and making the shadows on the walls warp and leap. They're whispering, singing, chanting, a language she's never heard in her life. Again, all at once, she's dizzy and sick, and she catches herself on the doorframe to keep from crumpling, bile surging into her throat. In the center of the space is the fire. In the center of the fire is an altar. On the altar is... She jerks her gaze away. She doesn't see. She doesn't see what it is. Perhaps it was nothing. But she does see all those black eyes their owners raising their arms above the fire. And as she struggles to work her limbs into motion, get away, everything finally breaks open. She and her family huddled together and prayed for the hurricane to pass. And there were a few surreal moments when it did. She was too small to understand immediately what was happening, and it was the first hurricane she could remember. The howling wind ceased. The hammering of the rain dried up. All around and outside, the world was quiet. She scrambled to her feet, wanted to go outside because surely now it was safe. But her mother held her back, cupped Knox's face and shook her head, her expression brittle with anxiety. No, she said. No, it's not over. It's the eye. Little Morgan was perplexed by this. She imagined an enormous eye gazing down at them from the sky, evaluating them, judging whether or not they should survive this. The eye of God opening in the heart of the storm. She doesn't have the strength to fight the arms that circle around her. They're wind, and then they're solid, and then they're powerful beyond what she can muster. But she's not afraid. She looks up into the shining dark eyes hovering above her, and she wonders if she should be. They're deep brown, not black. She knows them. She trusted them. She trusts them. She first met them in the heart of the storm, when everything broke open. The man they belonged to saw her, judged her, and in spite of what she did, he chose her. And then everything went to hell. But really, it went to hell a long time ago. It began there. She sees it first as a shimmer to her right, near the door to the rear yard. As she turns to face it, still braced against the doorframe, the whispers swell, joined by the sound that drew her here. Those many and multi-toned voices, high and low, chanting as one. From the room where that bizarre ritual is taking place, from the air, from the light that comes from everywhere. That chanting air in front of her tears down the middle, splits open, and there he is. It's a living image, a moving picture, but not flat, like a projection on a screen. And she perceives it in flashes as she processes them. 
A man surrounded by heaps of mangled corpses. Another face spattered with blood. Another set of hands gripping a rifle. Obviously a soldier, but not American. With a snatch of lucidity, she notes that the uniform isn't right. The same uniform is on the crumpled body he's stumbling over, raising the rifle and firing at something she can't see. Behind her, the chanting is stuttering, fracturing, but she doesn't notice. It's barely important enough to be background. Everything is the man moving inside the tear in the world. And now she can see shadows churning around him, the glow of fire. Is that the shimmer of water in the distance beyond him? Black water, an equally black starless sky lit by a heavy moon. When did she last see the moon with this kind of clarity? A black needle rising, a bayonet about to run that moon through. Bizarrely, a memory breaks the roiling surface of her mind. This shape is ancient and familiar, seen years ago in school books. Monuments raised by the pharaohs to honor their gods. Which god does this one honor? One of the shadows rushes forward, cloaked, tall, and powerfully built, and the flash of a blade in its hand. The soldier dodges clumsily, whirls as the figure passes him, and stabs out with a bayonet at the end of his rifle. A scream rises above the chaos, rage and pain and surprise, and the soldier stabs again, again, again as the figure falls, stabbing over and over, his bloody face horribly contorted. Her hands are slick red. She can still taste it on her lips. Bile is still searing her throat, and the man pauses, his bayonet dripping, and turns and locks eyes with her. That piercing steel blue. His face is nearly lost beneath gore and torn flesh. Eyes. No, only one. The other is drowned in blood. Knox looks at him across no man's land, and something in her withers. Suddenly, she hears the cries from the next room. The soldier jerks his head toward them, as if he can hear them too. The unearthly light explodes, a blast that knocks her back and nearly off her feet, and the tear wavers and collapses, and the soldier is gone. The other soldier. She's reminded that he exists, and feels dimly guilty for forgetting. He's levering himself up, one arm wrapped around his middle and his back against the wall, mouthing something at her and gesturing frantically. We have to go. Now. Yes, she guesses they do. She goes to him, tottering at another blast of sound and light. And like she has so many times before, she gets her arm around him and hauls him up, half drags him toward the parlor. She steps over what's left of the black-eyed German skull. She doesn't look down, but somehow, insanely, she hears the squish of her boots in the blood. The house roars fury. The eye has passed over them, and the storm has resumed. Knox has no idea whether or not this is mercy. She and the soldier stagger through the door and into the final dregs of the night. Through the smoke, Dawn is crawling across no man's land, revealing all the men, the boys, no one could save. But she and this one are alive, for whatever that's worth now. It lives stained with blood in a trench of mud and in my tomb of memory. The soldier is named Ray. He tells her this as she rides with him back to the field hospital. His name is Ray Beaumont, he wants her to know that. His eyes are unfocused and exhausted from the pain as he says it. He falls unconscious seconds later. The truck rattles through holes and deep ruts. Ray isn't the only one in the back of the truck. Five other soldiers lie around him, roughly bandaged and bleeding through the dirty gauze, groaning. But Ray is silent. Ray. A prayer she heard in passing from a British chaplain the quavering voice of a young man, trying very hard to be strong. Lighten our darkness. She reaches out to touch his face. For a few moments, 
Everything seems brighter. Thank you, he whispers when she changes his dressings. He's been in and out of consciousness for the last day or so. His head wound is worse than she initially thought, although months later there won't be much of a visible scar. He'll have plenty of scars elsewhere. But when he's awake at all, she can feel him clinging to her with everything but his hands, as if she's all that guides him out of the dark. Thank you. He's such a polite boy. Her mother would love him. Thank you, she whispers. And he whispers, don't. In his fitful half-dreams, he calls her by some other woman's name. He's telling her that he'll be home soon. He's promising her. He says he's sorry for leaving her. He says this place isn't what he thought it would be. He says he's had to do things he wishes so much he hadn't done. And she thinks, don't. She plunges her hand into the crushed remains of a human brain, wriggles her fingers like maggots through the rubbery jelly. She's searching for something. If she finds it, she might be able to put the world back together. She might be able to put herself back together. The steely blue eye of the storm watches her, silently judging. She wakes up crying, and the guns thunder on and on. The only thing that gets her back to sleep is sitting at Ray's bedside. There's something about his quiet that quiets her, for a little while. But of course, it never lasts. As he lays her down and covers her with a blanket that smells of insomnia and nightmares, and so many long nights alone, she remembers that when they tried to build a life together in the confused world, after the war was allegedly done, She used to wake up crying in what should have been the safety of their marriage bed, and him holding her was the only thing that got her back to sleep. For a little while. But then in the morning she had to face the way he looked at her, that hurt confusion. Worse when she tried to talk about it, unable to promise him that she'd come back to a home that never existed. He tried so hard to build it for her. She was sorry. She had to do things she wishes so much she hadn't done. That tear in the world never healed, and she couldn't make him understand. She couldn't reach him. Neither could he reach her. She saw him through the tear, gazing at her across the no-man's land of a bed and a memory. Different bed now. He lays her down, and she wants to reach for him. But that land is too vast and too treacherous. There are horrible things waiting for her out there. There are things that might follow her to him. She reaches for him and she thinks, Don't. He promises that other woman that he'll come home. Then one day, Knox comes in with his breakfast, and he's sitting up in bed and staring at nothing, his face a slack blank. A letter is in his lap, held loosely between his fingers. Knox sets the tray down. He turns his head and looks up, and slowly he focuses. It was the flu, he says softly. Then, even softer, she's dead. Back in the trenches, trying to get away from that dark, lost gaze. She finds the mud and the screams and the thunder of barrage comforting, and hates that she does. She tries to save man after man, boy after boy, tries to ignore the chanting beneath the sound of the guns, and she tries not to think of Ray. Could you have ever gone home to her? Can we ever go home? If we do, what do we carry back with us? Sometimes, we carry each other. Knox blinks the smoke out of her eyes. It stings, but she can tell it's the after effects. She's out of the smoke itself. The smoke and... There was more. She's sure of it. She was lost in it 
and she made the choice to give the way out to... Pack? Was it Pack? The ceiling. Cracked. That water stain in the corner that looks like the guesswork map of some unexplored continent. Familiar. She's home. All right. Easy. She turns her head, strong hand sliding under her neck, helping lift her enough to drink from the tumbler pressed against her lips. The water is cold and good, and it soothes her burning throat. She manages not to gulp. After a moment, the hand lowers her back down onto the pillow. She hears the sound of the glass set down on the table beside the bed. It's weirdly loud. She takes a shaky breath and looks up at the man gazing down at her. And she knows she's in for it, and there's nothing to be done about it. Just got to slog through, like always. Morgan, Ray says heavily, we have to talk. You're listening to The Shadow Files of Morgan Knox, narrated by Pilar Uribe. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. The Shadow Files of Morgan Knox is written by K. Arsenault Rivera, Brooke Bolander, Gabino Iglesias, and Sonny Moraine. Produced by Marco Palmieri and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.